Well, many of you know that in a remarkable display of resilience, the K-State Wildcats overcame an 11-point deficit to claim... That's the most exciting thing for some of you all, all week long. So far, so, yeah, that's a good start. Except not for, the, uh, not for the Jayhawks, of course. And this is not news for many of you. And I want to invite you for just a moment at least to set aside your bias for one team or the other and consider the themes of perseverance and hope in a game that might mirror the themes that we are exploring in the scriptures for today. Because just as a sports team on any game and any field can turn a seemingly bleak uh, situation into a great celebration through teamwork and perseverance, we see in Isaiah this shift from a message of judgment to one of hope. These passages in Isaiah set in times of turmoil and uncertainty remind us that even when the situation seems bleak, hope and redemption are always within reach. Today we're looking at this story from the Bible in Isaiah, but we're connecting it with God's big story that began in creation in Genesis and continues to teach us lessons today. From September to May, we are going through the Bible, the whole Bible from beginning to end, from Genesis to uh, uh, the stories of creation to the stories of the early church as we look towards the New Testament. I've used a technology to help improve today's sermon with word choice and ideas and images. You'll see some of those on the screen here in just a few moments, and I hope you find this message meaningful, that you find some things that you want to remember and reflect on in the days ahead, there's a space for you in your bulletin to take some notes so that you can reflect on the ways that God might be speaking you today and in the days ahead. So take that out and jot down some things as we continue today. So let's recall the stories of faith and challenge and hope that we've journeyed together through in the Bible over the last several weeks. Two weeks ago, we were in the book of 1 Kings, looking at chapter 18, where Elijah confronts the prophets of Baal. It is a powerful story of a showdown between God's power and the power of false gods, which turns out to be none at all. It's a story of God's triumph and a call for us to trust God completely. Last week, we turned our attention to Hosea, specifically in chapter 11, this passage of Scripture that describes God's love for each of us as a parent loves a child. It painted this picture of God as a loving parent who's heartbroken over the paths that the people of Israel have chosen, but always ready to embrace them with open arms. We also turn away from God's path at times, and God's enduring love and mercy is always available for you and for me. Today, we dive into the story of Isaiah, and in Isaiah 5, we find the vineyard's tale, a parable that speaks of, again of God's disappointment with the people of Israel, but the narrative doesn't end there. This prophetic book changes, and in chapter 11, we see a message of hope. It describes a shoot growing up from the stump of Jesse, symbolizing a new beginning and the coming of a righteous leader. Over the last several weeks, we've seen this journey through God's power demonstrated in Elijah's story, through the depths of God's love in Hosea, and today in the disappointment and the hope that we see in these two passages from the book of Isaiah. These stories teach us about how God has connected with people over time. They show us something about who God is and help us live out our lives faithfully as followers of Jesus. So let's take a closer look at Isaiah. These two passages from chapter 5 and chapter 11 are two significant passages, not only in this book, but in the entire Old Testament. Isaiah is one of the most significant prophets, one of the most significant books in this collection. It's seen as a collection of prophecies that's set during the time of the rules of King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. These are all kings of Judah. As you remember that Israel, the nation of Israel, as it's been divided, has already been wiped out. It's around the 8th century BCE when these passages were written, and the kingdom of Judah was facing significant political and social turmoil. This is not news. It happens over and over again in the Old Testament, and it happens over and over again for us today. At that time, they were in danger of being crushed by the Assyrian Empire. It was a huge empire, and the gap between those that were wealthy and those that were poor was growing. The people were going through the motions in their religious life. It had become more of a habit or a ritual, and it had lost meaning for them. 
and the ethical and the moral dimensions of their faith, where they lived it out in the world, they kind of set that aside. And it's in this context that Isaiah is speaking to the people. He's prophesying to say, the way that society is, the way that you see it right now, this is not the way that things should be. There is a place where justice and righteousness should be front and center instead of set aside to the sidelines. And so we see in Isaiah chapter 5, this, uh, this, the early chapters of Isaiah are known for their prophecies of judgment. And this is exactly what we find here. This section might be known as the, the song of the vineyard or the vineyard's tale. It uses this metaphor as God as a vineyard owner and Israel as the vineyard. The passage laments the vineyard's inability, its failure to produce good grapes, symbolizing Israel's inability to live righteously despite God's care and provision. And the allegory here is rich. It, it highlights God's disappointment and the impending judgment due to Israel's social injustice and moral failures. Why aren't you producing good grapes and instead producing poor grapes? I've given you everything that you need, God says. And this parable sets the tone for the upcoming prophecies of judgment it's placed right here in this place to serve as a contrast between what was experiencing in the world and the people at that time and the message of hope that we'll move to in chapter 11. And in chapter 11, we find this drastic change in tone. The focus is on a hopeful future instead of judgment for the past. It prophesies a righteous ruler from the line of Jesse, who was David's father. And the anticipation of a ruler in Isaiah 11 reflects the desire for leaders who would be just and fair instead of the corrupt political leaders that they saw of the day. It also mirrors the Near Eastern belief at that time in a divinely appointed king who would uphold justice and peace. Now, many people interpret these passages right here in Isaiah as a prophecy of the Messiah, of someone, a, a leader who would embody understanding and wise counsel and obedience to God's justice and mercy. This passage is filled with hope. It contrasts the earlier passage of judgment and destruction. And though they're different in tone, they're connected. Isaiah 5's message of judgment helps set the stage for the eventual restoration and peace that we see in Isaiah 11. This contrast between disappointment and a hopeful future from God underscores this central theme of the Bible. Again, we see it over and over, redemption and restoration. Redemption and restoration after the people have failed. It happens over and over again. And in the broader context of this whole biblical story, we see that these passages are pivotal in understanding the nature of God's relationship with the people of Israel, with us today, the understanding of God's justice and the promise of a Messiah. They echo these themes in other prophetic books, but also in the New Testament. When we see this image of the vineyard and the vine and the branch from Jesse's roots being referenced both in the Gospels and in the letters of Paul, which we'll come to later in the months ahead. So what does all, all this mean for us today? I think many of us know what it's like to put our heart and soul into something only to watch it wither and fade. I spent a whole summer, two summers ago, tending to a vegetable garden in our front yard, and I woke up early to water the plants. I pulled the weeds. I cared for that soil as if it were one of my own children, and it flourished. The tomatoes grew ripe and red, the cantaloupe burst with flavor, and the zucchini thrived. Of course, the zucchini thrived. But this past summer, my attention wavered. <laughs> I got busy with travel and work and other hobbies, and our garden gradually faded. It was choked with weeds and bare ground. Like the vineyard in Isaiah's song, my garden failed because I had neglected it. In our lives today, it is sometimes easy to let our faith wither because we're not paying attention, just as I let my garden fade. Sometimes when we look about the anger and the tribalism that we see in our society today, it can slowly choke out our spirits if we don't diligently pay attention to the good and what brings life. 
We see technological innovation in a number of fields that threatens to displace jobs, and sometimes that can worry us away from generosity. The despair of our polarized political life can suppress our hope if we don't nurture that hope through being connected with others. Our connections can break down if they're not woven together in love. And though painting a dire portrait, Isaiah also shows us this vision of harmony within and between all people. We can see each other, each one of our neighbors for who they are and pay attention to justice and understanding and peace. So as you reflect this week, as you move into the days ahead, consider where your faith needs nurturing. What weeds perhaps need to be gently pulled from your soul? Where can you pour out more love in your life and in your relationships? What hopeful seeds are waiting to be sown even now? Our lives can be like this vineyard, can be like gardens, but they need gentle and patient attention. Take some time with your soul. Get to know what is growing there and see what needs tending and attention. Through care and time, our souls can blossom and produce fruit. In Isaiah, we see a powerful message that connects deeply with the good news of Jesus Christ. We learn about this vineyard that God cared for but didn't yield good fruit, symbolizing the failure of the people of God. But then the prophet gives us hope, prophesying a righteous leader who would come from this family line, which we understand to be Jesus. And the good news is that Jesus embodies this hope and righteousness. Jesus represents a new shoot, bringing life and renewal where there was once desolation and darkness. Through Jesus, God's redemptive love is vividly demonstrated. He teaches us to bear good fruit in our lives, fruit of love and compassion and justice. And in this way, we see God's unending love for you and for me, for all people. And we see the transformative power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus' teachings as a pathway to righteousness and hope. Just as the vineyard needs tending and the promise of a just leader brings hope, we are called to be active participants in creating a world that reflects God's love and justice. As individuals, we can be a part of that by doing acts of kindness in our everyday life, small gestures that can make a big difference in someone else's life just like each vine in the vineyard matters. As a community, we seek to do that together by serving. We invite you to serve in projects like donating to our Christmas giving tree, working together to bring about positive change in our community and being the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. So while sports fans might rejoice or mourn any particular game, In a shift from despair to hope, the book of Isaiah reminds us of the power of perseverance and faith. We might face impossible challenges in our lives, but we too can find strength and hope in our relationship with God and each other. So let Isaiah's story of resilience and triumph inspire us to tend to our own spiritual gardens, nurturing faith, hope, and love, even in difficult times. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, thank you for your unending love and patience. Please help us to walk in the way of justice, kindness, and humility. Grow in us the fruits of your Holy Spirit that we may live as followers of your Son, Jesus Christ. Unite us in hope and bless us with your peace. Amen.